Welcome to Why I'll Never Make It, a lighthearted podcast that takes a revealing look at a career in the entertainment industry, featuring stories and interviews with those on stage and backstage, on screen and behind the scenes. I'm Patrick Oliver Jones, and this is Why I'll Never Make It. Hello, hello. Is it just me, or has it been a long time? Well, I hope you've had a great summer. We're now into the fall season, and I hope that you've had a good one. We took two or three months off, and I was in a show, Dewey was in a show. In fact, you're probably noticing you haven't heard Dewey yet. Dewey is also in another show, so he is uh, certainly being a busy man doing his duty. So I'm going to hold down the fort for a few episodes here, so it's just going to be you and me. In the meantime, uh, let me tell you about one of the additions that we're bringing to the show this time around, and that is the Spotlight Series. As you know, we release our episodes every two weeks, and so in between those weeks now is what we're going to call the Spotlight Series, where we will go a little bit more in-depth into interviews, and it's going to be featuring people who have been in the business, have now transitioned elsewhere, maybe people who have been in the business for decades and have so much experience and can now look back at what the business used to be, how it's changed, those types of things. So it's going to be a chance to talk to some people in different fields of the business that we haven't had a chance to talk to in the regular program. So I'm really looking forward to that, and we have some great guests that are already lined up for that, and you'll be hearing more about that. But for now, let's get into why we're all here, which is why I'll never make it. So I wanted to start off this season with something that I actually posted online a few weeks ago, but I thought that I would share it here because it's just so relevant to what we talk about, about why we'll never make it, about what are those things that hold us back? What are those things that that just tell us, no, this isn't going to happen? And this is something that I actually found uh, a while ago. It's a bucket list that I made, you know, I think it was three years ago in the summer of 2015, and I decided to make this bucket list of people that I wanted to work with, shows I wanted to be in, theaters I wanted to work at, and I made this list, and it was about, it was about 49, if I remember, 49 or so items that I wanted to check off eventually, and so of that list of 49, I auditioned or worked toward about 26 of them. I was actually offered five of them, and I accepted two of them. So that makes a completion percentage of about 4%. Now, you see, that compares with another stat that I calculated from last year. Of all my auditions, that's theater, TV, commercial, everything, I booked about 6% of them. That doesn't sound like a lot, does it? But that's, that kept me going, and I actually made a living out of 6%. And so, but that's just another reminder of how tough this business is for some of us. Well, maybe for most of us. But my feed on Facebook and Instagram is just filled with people that are soaring to heights that I have yet to reach. They're booking shows and contracts that I've barely come close to. And, and, and they're also booking them with a consistency that I have yet to achieve. You see, as, as wonderful as their accomplishments are, and I'm, and I'm proud of their successes because these are my friends that I'm following on social media. So I am so happy and proud of them. But jealousy's voice can still be heard. And that comparison spiral begins. It, you know, it, it's something that I try to avoid because I, I realize it is fruitless to compare myself and to go down that path. But all I can do is just move forward. And a reason why that bucket list kind of came to mind, yes, I was just kind of scrolling through some notes and happened upon it, but the reason why it hit me so hard is because that day I was actually going to a temp agency to apply for uh, a job, you know, to be on their roster so I could uh, start doing that. And part of me, part of me, it felt like I was, falling behind. I was failing in some way because uh, now I have to be at a temp agency instead of being able to work and just audition and just go, go, go. But 
I had to realize that, you know what? We all have to make it. I've gone through four months. I've gone through 11 months without any work. In those times, you still have to make a living. You still have to pay the rent. So it's not me failing. It's just me doing something else to keep on living. And that's what I have to remind myself of. And it also leads me to a great example of why I'm still here. Why I'm still here is the journey. The journey. The stories that I get to tell, the experiences that I get to share. And I was reminded of this at an audition that I was at. It was a commercial audition. And in this audition, uh, it was for a role that would actually be in a costume. And so the director was asking, have you worked in costumes? Have you done this? And I said, well, yes, I actually worked at Disney World for a while. And I explained that I was in the Hunchback of Notre Dame show, and I was one of the gargoyles. And if you didn't get around to seeing the show, it's no longer there, unfortunately, but oh, it was such a wonderful show. The costume that the gargoyles wore, really you could see about a circle of our face and everything else from our head, our ears, everything from down to our feet was covered in this foam. Uh, it was just so hot. It was so hot. It was this foam costume that was obviously meant to look like cement, looked like a chiseled out statue of a gargoyle. And in that, we had to kind of bounce around like they do in the movie. And you had to, of course, animate your, yourself as a cement figure. And so I, I was sharing this story, and it just, it just brought back great memories of my time at Disney. And it just made me think that, yes, in, in the moment, in the now, I may not be doing everything I want to be doing, but my goodness, the things that I have done, the things that I've accomplished, the stories that I can tell whenever a director asks, hey, have you been in costumes before? The experiences that I have are so wonderful and rich, and that's why I'm still here, because my journey is going to keep going, and I'm still going to have more stories to tell that I have yet to reach. And I can't wait to see what those stories are going to be, what those shows are, what those people are that I'm going to be working with. Two of the people that I've had a chance to work with over the years is Wojcik and C Casting, Scott Wojcik and Gail C. They have been very good to me over the years, bringing me in for various off-Broadway shows as well as regional productions. And I am so glad that they agreed to join me on this first episode back after the summer. I had a chance to sit down with them in their Midtown Manhattan office and talk with them about their lives before casting directors and what their life has been since being on the other side of the table and casting us actors. All right, well, here I am in the offices of Wojcik and C Casting. Thank you both for joining me on the podcast. A pleasure. Thanks for coming by today. <laughs> you're already laughing. I am. Because <laughs> you're just so happy to be here, too. I am. <laughs> so I'll have both of you introduce yourself, Gail and Scott, and just kind of talk about how you got into casting. Uh, I am Gail C. I got into casting sort of by accident. I was an actor, and... I was in an audition for a production of A Chorus Line. You may have heard of it. And it's a little show. Yeah. <laughs> a little show. And they said, um, what do you do if you can't dance anymore? Which is the crux of the play, if you don't know that. <laughs> and um, we all kind of laughed. And she said, no, I really want to know. And what are you going to do? And went down the line. And by the time she got to me, I thought, well, I'd like to do what you're doing, maybe. And the next day, I picked up the phone and called my friend Scott Wojcik, who was working for a guy named Charles Rosen. And I said, what do you do? Can I come help you? And then it kind of So, So had, had you thought about casting before that question was Not posted? really. Not it just really. kind of hit you at that moment. It just kind of hit me. I was like, oh, I could maybe try that. Yeah, I really had no idea what I was getting into. But I ended up loving it. And you're still so. figuring out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every day. Because things have changed. Did, I didn't realize, did you do that before you started casting for um, stages and and stuff for Rod? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. You were that. first. Oh, wow. <laughs> you, were oh, you, you were the first. I, you were the yeah, first. I was your first. I haven't been anybody's first in a very long time. Um, <laughs> that was great. Um, for, uh, for me, I actually cast my first show when I was nine. 
Um, I was in. Did you cast yourself? I did because you know, and all my friends. Um, you know, the movie musicals would come on once a year, and I, the family, would watch, and I would get very excited about that stuff. And I went into the school the next day, and I told the principal that I needed to do that for the school. And it had been Chitty Chitty Bang Bang the night before, so we did a production of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang <laughs> on our stage at Byfield Elementary School in Bristol, mm -hmm. Rhode Island. Uh, and I got the bug then. So. I'd always been involved in it, and then uh, when I moved to New York after going to school, um, I started working in casting offices to network uh, because I figured if they would just meet me, then my career would catapult into the superstar that as I a, thought it as a performer. Yes, as a performer, yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I was getting my work and stuff, and and then started working at this joint called Acting Management, and they had a, uh, like five different casting offices out of the same location, and you started to work as a reader for one, and then you were working as a camera op for another. And that turned into a full-time job with Charles Rosen, mm -hmm. uh, and then later became his partner after a couple of years. And then Gail came and joined us when he was getting to the point where he was ready to retire. So it was all kind of a planned uh, progression of, of kind of attrition of who owned the office. And then when Charles left, Gail and I opened up uh, the next day. And we actually had wow. to come into the office on New Year's Eve day to create a logo for a resume so we could send it to a producer who wanted to hire us but we didn't have a resume yet because we weren't a company yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, um, you weren't really right. going yeah. so yeah. then you had to you know, yeah. send it all in. Uh, so we did that and that first tour uh, was a production of Joseph and the Amazing Technical Dreamcoat. And there have been a few of those tours yes. throughout the years. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And so from there to uh, what we're doing now. And both of you started in performing before you ever got into casting really. Yeah. Performing is kind of was the the launch pad for you getting into casting. Yeah. And how have you found the difference between your performing careers and then now into your casting careers? Uh, I think for me, it's interesting, you know, I, I think control as just a topic um, is, is an important thing to talk about in the industry just in terms of what you have control over in the audition process and, and who you're working for and then you work for yourself and kind of balancing all that. As an actor, I thought I was talented and just wasn't getting a break. So I didn't feel like I had a lot of control and I thought that I was good enough at performing and smart enough to be more successful than I was feeling at that time. So when I jumped over into casting, there was an initial sense of more control because I knew what my job was and I knew what I was supposed to be doing. But you know, as the years go on, you know, control's a, a, an interesting topic because while we control what our office does, um, we have no control over who the final choices are. So right. that for me has actually led to more of an interest in directing because I'd like to make the final decision and not facilitate somebody else's, which is great and that's what we do. But in, in regard to that, I would like to move on to a place where I make the final decision. In that final to, step. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I was actually very fortunate as an actor. Mm -hmm. So, and I sort of ticked off all the boxes I wanted to do. And, you know, at that chorus line audition, when she was saying what she was saying. Oh yeah, did you actually book that? I did, yeah. <laughs> um, but I didn't do it. I turned it down. <laughs> don't do that, actors. Don't do that. Don't turn it down. Don't audition for something and turn it down. Um, <laughs> Tip number one. We'll get that. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, you know, that's when it occurred to me, and I called Scott, and that kind of became my survival job. Was mm -hmm. working for him and Charles, and then working at different places, and then I kind of dabbled while I was still acting and um, and doing casting at the same time. It wasn't until I transitioned, and I, I wasn't ready to transition until like I finally like lived my dream, and I was in a Broadway show. But I found myself going to their office like on my day off, and mm -hmm. you know, between the, shows, between shows, because I, I loved being there so much, and it, that's when it kind of hit me like I think I'm okay. Like, yeah, I think I've sort of done you, all the things I wanted to do, and I was I'm not like a fr fr uh, frustrated actor who couldn't get a job and was like, I'm gonna get back at those people who took my job. Yeah, get on yeah. the other side. It really, it was kind of a nice progression, and we've been, I've been very, very fortunate. And so do either of you miss that performing, being on stage? There's something that I do miss. Um, I don't miss the anxiety that, that, that went with it. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, but for me now, I've, I get that outlet in a, in a teaching environment. So that still puts me in front of people. It still lets me kind of craft a character of myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that fills the void. Yeah. yeah it's, it's rare that I find myself like, oh. Yeah, because I was about to say, that obviously new shows keep coming yeah. out. And you're like, oh, I would love to do a show like this or, or We were fortunate enough recently. We worked on the Something Rotten 
tour that's going out now. Right. And when we were doing that, I was, and when I saw it, I was like, I would have been in the show. Like, this is exactly what I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so the, but it's, it's, it's kind of rare, which is good. I think it's good that it's not something that, you know, we actively want to do anymore because I think that can kind of color your... Yeah, well, it would also conflict and, and one would take you away from the other. Yeah. It would. Which is, which I, I assume you both had to come to, ter- as you did, you come to terms with like, I've finished this career, now onto the next yeah. one. You can't really kind of dabble yeah. in both successfully. Yeah. I've actually been, it's funny, like Church and State, I right. did the first table read because I was never going to do the play and I knew that and they knew that, so it was fine. So it was like, great come be an actor for a minute. I was like, this is fun. Because I don't have, I didn't have the pressure of right. caring if I right. did it again. Or, you right. Know, you just got to kind of exercise those muscles again. Now I probably can do that because, you know, the muscles don't work the way they used to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there might come a day where, as an old character actor, I might <laughs> jump back in. Right. Um, it would be a, another chapter of life, uh, but not a chapter that's going to start anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, occasionally a commercial breakdown will come across our desk mm. or somebody will contact about something and yeah. say, oh, you're kind of right for this. And in the commercial world, you know, it's a one-off. It's, it's just, it's a day based on something other than kind of, you know, it's based on a different criteria. Mm-hmm. Um, so if that happened, it wouldn't interfere with anything or get in the way of a point of view on the casting side. So sure, but not anytime soon. Unless you're going to hire us. Are you going to write a show for us? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll start writing one. There should be a sitcom about this environment. (laughs) Yeah, it would would be good. That, 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 well, I mean, Smash kind of sort of tried. They tried, yeah. yeah. But it became a little too soap opera-y, and and some of it was real, and then other parts were like, okay, that would just never happen. No. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. One odd, sing 32 bars and, you know, book a lead in a Broadway show, I think, was kind of what happened. Yeah, that would never Right, right. There's a few steps in between. Just a couple (laughs) every now and then. Yep. Well, speaking about those steps, since you both came from the performing world and then got into casting, was there anything that you learned or brought from your performance like I mean I I think our office treats actors the way we would want to be treated and I think we treat people based on how we were treated which was mostly good Mm -hmm. um you know there's always the stories about the the bad day or the or the mean person behind the table um we work really hard not to be those people now and like giving actors as much information as possible like if you're at an open we're at open calls and it's taking a really long time we like to go in and talk to everybody and just be like hey guys this is what's going on this is why it's taking so long you'll be real happy when you're in there because they're <laughs> going to spend lots of time with you too but this is what's this is why and just kind of trying to give as much information as possible so everybody knows what's going on oh and, communication is yeah, key and yeah because i feel yeah. like information is so much more accessible now than it was when we were acting anyway mm-hmm. you know for good or for bad you know i think the more the actor can know the more empowered they are to make choices and do things and so the more information we can get the better and that's something that we didn't get as for much sure of. absolutely and, and you know the the uh, one of the things i'd like to go back and tell a younger version of me would be that you're a problem solver so you should walk in feeling that way mm-hmm. um it, we really do want you to be good and you know that gets said all the time it's really true because somebody has to be good so that the job gets done because we don't want to do another session because that costs time and money and that costs mm-hmm. the producer time and money and it's it is a monetized environment now it's not just about the art in your heart anymore it's really about monetizing that and turning it into a product and that means there's a budget involved so you know do well and you're going to solve the problem so own that be, and, be informed and the by quicker that. you solve that problem the better yeah, yeah. and yeah. trust the process a little bit more like we want to solve the problem so if you are the solution, I promise you, we will make sure you get in front of <laughs> yeah, them. You yeah. know? But if you're not, trust that too. Yeah. You know? would, would you say that's probably your number one tip when it comes to people coming into audition to, to bring that kind of attitude, that, sign, that kind of confidence into the room? Yeah, because I think it takes the confrontation out of it mm-hmm. and it takes the fight or flight response out of the environment, which nobody does their best work when they're in crisis. Yeah, when they feel like there's adversaries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just come in and do what you do and know that not right doesn't mean not good and just do your best and forget about it Word. until, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because if you're right for it, you'll be back. Because at the end of every day, there's a stack of pictures that aren't going to get a call back. They're amazingly talented people. Mm-hmm. It's just 
you know, it, it's, it's, it's like putting out a buffet and you have to know the taste of the people who are dining. And if you're a vegetarian, then all the Kobe beef is going to go to waste on the table. You know? yeah. So you pack it up and vacuum seal it and put it away until a carnivore comes into the room. Yeah. The... I love that you're relating <laughs> casting to food. Always. I like that. Always. Yes. yes, always food. And yes. and I've been at your auditions and there is always a plethora of snacks and yeah. food <laughs> That's at all the on table. Pearl. That's Pearl Studios. That, Pearl Studios for they, you. They're the snack masters. Yeah, the snack masters. I love it. I love yeah. it. So with regards to uh, to casting, so once someone has come into the room, what is it that you're looking for? People talk about the X factor. They talk about, does it differ with each show or is there a common denominator amongst auditions and shows that you're looking for? I mean, I kind of think it's different because like our job is to fill someone else's vision. So whatever their vision is, is what we're looking for. But I mean, generally, you know, confidence in people making choices and I love when people come in and make their own choices, not their version of what someone else did. Mm -hmm. You know, not their version of Kristen Cheno as Galinda. You know what I mean? Which is mm -hmm. fine, and that's obviously amazing and valid, but I'd rather see what you do with the part, not mm -hmm. what you think she did. Does that make sense? No, no, you know? it, no it makes total sense. Because and and, if they want a carbon copy of that, they'll direct you to do that too. If yep. you are the right package and you are the right ilk, that you'll get a chance to do it again and yeah. they'll do it you'll they'll have you do it that way because i i've been in that room where i i would bring my own and then yeah. they kind of get me back into well we, we need you to fill this slot so please do it like right. this right and then i've come in researching and listening to all the soundtracks and previous yeah. performances and i bring that and I'm like we just want you to be you and it, so i've i've brought both of those and been yeah i feel like go twisted with you. the other way <laughs> go with you. Go with you. yeah <laughs> because it's it's finding someone that can do what technically is on the page isn't hard you know and I, th I, mm -hmm. and I think and yeah. to the, mm -hmm. the initial question about like what what's a good thing to happen in the room the, the more prepared you are the more free you are to be artistic as opposed to be a mimic or mm -hmm. or, or some other version of a played at idea mm -hmm. on, on what the role is about um, and I, I think what I notice the most lately is the people that are off book um, really comfortable with the material because they either were smart enough to research it before the process happened so it wasn't just a five-day process and they found out on Tuesday that they need to be ready on Thursday they already knew that show was coming down the pipe and they've already done the research and so it's already more organic in them yeah. and it j they relax more less fight-or-flight they're more confident the director notices that confidence there's more comfort for the director to feel confident about that person so it just feeds each into itself until everybody's like yay this is exactly what we want it to be mm -hmm. and they're not always the most ideal talent skill set but they just own themselves and they own the idea the essence of the character and that just makes them a guarantee yeah. and makes the directors comfortable and that's really important and and something that you brought up about you're really fulfilling someone else's vision I assume that, that that you sometimes get into a disagreement. Director wants one, you see another, and is there ever that kind of battle of wills, like, but no, you really want to look at this one over this one? Yeah, but we don't get to pick. We don't get right. to yeah. So, I mean, yes, we can, and we do. We're like, you know what, could you just take one look? Or there are certain directors that we work mm -hmm. with that are very open to that. Like, mm -hmm. I, we were working with somebody who I sat next to for 15 years and I was like, I know this might sound strange to you, but can we see this girl for the Arbiter in chess? Cause I think she'd be amazing. And he was like, okay. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you know, like it was crazy. She got called back and she was amazing, but ultimately it was all orchestrations that so many orchestrations would have had to be changed and blah, blah, blah. Oh, right. Yeah. Our job is present, present what they want. And yeah. you know, we try to sneak them in here and there to be like, try this. Yeah. I, I, I agree completely. I think, um, in regards to filling, you know, somebody else's vision, um, our power ends with who gets brought into the room, mm -hmm. and that's the reputation we build: is that we have the right eye or the right uh, sense of qualities that mm -hmm. we know what to present. Mm -hmm. Once we're in the room, some some creative teams we manage the room, mm -hmm. and we're not consulted. And it's not that we're not involved; it's that's not what our purview is. That's not right. the lane that we're Your role driving in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we acknowledge yeah. that, and we are there to be available as needed but if we're not asked we're not asked and then we have other teams that actively say who do you think is right and why and mm -hmm. you know there have been there have been circumstances where we've been more forceful in our opinion right um because we really think that we're right and we think that we know exactly what it needs to be and sometimes we win and sometimes we don't you yeah. know because yeah. ultimately like Elle said it's the director and there's some the directors producer. that we've worked with for a long time that like we know what they like so what much 
it's never what we like, but we're like, oh, so and so's really gonna like this actor. Absolutely. Because right. like, yeah. we know what they like, even though it might not be our, you know. Yeah, it's not your cup of tea, but you know what they want, and yes. so you start to fill in those yeah. slots. So through the year, okay. we'll be like, oh, this director's gonna like this guy, put it here, and when we go back to him, we'll put the, you know, put yeah. this guy in front of him because he's gonna really like So, this in a weird sort of way, is it like you guys are auditioning for theaters that you work for, and as far as like what, what you bring to the table, and if they like you, then they'll keep having you yeah. cast yeah. for them over yeah. and over again. Yeah. So yeah. it's a little bit of auditioning on your end as well. It is. Yeah. In some, some... Absolutely, and it's funny because, you know, it's the same thing with us in getting jobs. Because, you know, when somebody, like we had a meeting this afternoon with a brand new theater, and like, if they like us, great. You know, the first one's like our audition. And then if mm -hmm. they continue to like us, then hopefully we'll just keep doing it. Yeah. And if they don't, then, yeah. And how does that process work? Do you just talk about your process, your vision of casting, and how you operate, basically? Yes. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I'll ask specific questions, like, what do you think of this? And, you know, it, it's also human, yeah. you know, because you, yeah. you got to like yeah. the people. Yeah, do you yeah. like each other? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you make each other laugh a little bit? Can it? Does it feel comfortable? You know, that's why, for, for Gail and I, we think it's import, really important to have a, an infrastructure and an office yeah. environment, um, because it... it it kind of reads what we've done and it has our personalities in it and and our vibe is here so we like to invite people into mm -hmm. our space um because it's part of our environment that helps us uh, helps create what wojixi casting is yeah um and i think that's a good thing um and yeah it, it's important to connect they have to trust you know um and and sometimes they're very experienced and so they know exactly what they want and it's do we fit what they need and sometimes they're very inexperienced and they kind of look to us to tell them what they need oh, okay. um, yeah. and that's great because yeah. you know everybody starts somewhere and it's about relationship building and that's our networking right um because we work so we have such a great regional client base um but at any given time as management changes or or teams change we're one phone call away from not having that theater, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and that makes sense because they've been loyal to us. And if someone new is running it, well, they're going to be loyal perhaps to somebody else. Yeah. Right. So we're always auditioning. And, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Building the client base. Yeah. And, and you both have mentioned personality. I assume that that goes doubly well for the actors that you bring in, their personality, how they interact with you yeah. guys, how they interact with the directors. Yeah. And I assume that that's something that you can tell it's like, oh, this person really has a good personality or works well, maybe this one doesn't. So yeah. I assume yeah. that you can also offer that kind of advice when it comes to casting, that personal side. Definitely, you know, a lot happens in the lobby and, yeah. and how people treat monitors. You know, monitors turn into casting directors, monitors uh -huh. turn into agents. Yep. Um, so you have to be careful who, you have to treat everybody with respect. And if you think yeah. somebody is not at your level for some foolish reason, that's going to get relayed to us. Mm -hmm. And why would we insert that person into a family environment at a regional theater on yeah. a tight timeline? The first, um, the first tour I ever booked, they told me later, like in rehearsal, we were out for drinks or whatever, and they were like, you know, we knew we were going to hire you in the elevator before the audition. And I was like, what? Elevator. And they were like, you were so nice to everyone as we were waiting in line in the building, and you helped that lady pick up her thing, and then you held the door, and we were like, I wonder who that is. <laughs> so I just thought that was hilarious because and, and I had no room. recollection whatsoever of any of that. I was like, what? And they're like, and then we saw you on the corner teaching the dance step to that other girl who was lost. And they were just hmm. like, so we were just like, we like her. I hope she can sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can. yeah. So who knew? And who especially on a tour, it is so much about getting along and just yeah. being, because you're around each other 24-7 yeah. and you have to be able to get along with people. Yep. So in casting shows, you must run into challenging either the audition itself or theaters or what what do you find is is the most difficult or challenging part of casting a show hmm that is that's, hard that's, that's hard, hard because like every single process is different and everyone has its own different challenges for various reasons it could be teams that disagree which happens or it could be sometimes it's know, just the number of people that we're trying to just get managing, just the size the of the audition shows up yeah and, and so you know sometimes I just feel flat out bad because because of theater's budgets and we have less time to do everything in and there's 12 characters in a show and we have one day to cast it so we're you know, only able to see like three people per role and then we get a request list that's a mile long and then suddenly from s breakdowns we can choose one person to fill a slot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that's frustrating and and challenging and I mean I think it's also exciting when it's a new a new project 
So yeah. it's the the challenge is an exciting challenge yeah. because it's never been done before. So you're you're really conceiving an idea or part of the conception of an idea which then leads into other challenges because if it's not flushed out yet then maybe the creatives don't agree on what it's supposed to be so mm -hmm. then we're serving more than yeah. one you know creative point of view and trying to solve it in a short period of time so you know the environment of casting has changed a lot in the past 20 years um, there used to be a lot more time and a lot more budget so you just kind of saw people until you were done and now it's like we have you know one of our regional theaters it was like you have six days mm -hmm. and everything has to be cast and we were yeah. like, but the whole, the whole season, the whole season. Yeah. Yeah. And we're like, but, and they're like, and that's what it was. And that theater was, was specific and direct. And yeah. so therefore we knew what the challenge was and therefore you get it done. But that's also happening with rehearsal processes as well. Absolutely. So budgets yeah. are just yeah. consolidating yeah. Yeah. on yeah. your end as well as on our, you know, performing yeah. rehearsal end. Absolutely. Yeah. Without a doubt. More, more to the need for yeah. actors to continue training. You know, because you, your talents are one thing, but you have to continue to develop the skill set and your ability to absorb material quickly. And, you know, the, the, the comment in the audition rooms from musical theater folks when you ask them about their movement of abilities mm -hmm. and, you know, dance or move. And so many people are like, I just need a little bit more time and I'm just as good as the next guy. Great. We don't have more time. Like, that, right. there isn't an extra day. Like, there's, mm -hmm. there's no after school classes for, <laughs> you know, the remedial. You know, like, you're not a dancer. So that's, that's cool. But I think it just kind of creates this environment where everybody thinks, like, if, I'm, if I tell you I can get it done, like, that's good enough. But there's a reality you to that. You have to show it. Yeah. 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 And I think um, everything being so electronic, we're managing a lot more videos than we used to. Mm -hmm. For good or for bad, you know, I'm still personally not a fan of videos for theater because I feel it's an it's an immediate intimate. As someone thing. who makes a lot of them, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. Like, I think it's a really hard thing to do, yeah. and that's challenging on our end because suddenly there's managing a hundred videos and making sure they get uploaded and everyone sees them. And sometimes we feel bad because people will just send videos that we didn't ask for. Oh, they and, just submit on their own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and and we get them. And it's hard because we're like, but they're not going to look at this. That's why we said no videos. But it, yeah. I don't know. And we don't like to make people spend money and do work that's unnecessary. Like right. we're very big on like if they're not going to look at the videos, we're not going to take them. Yeah. <laughs> you know because Absolutely. it doesn't it doesn't behoove us. And both of you have right. have mentioned. Uh, getting back into like the educational part of it and kind of steering the the college people in that transition yeah. from graduating to becoming professionals and you you talked about how you kind of wish that they would learn this or do that what what would you say are the things that you try to impart with them so that they can make that transition a lot easier um a lot of the things we've been talking about, about, you know, empowering yourself and, you know, there's a vo vocabularies developed, right? And like, you know, there's a lot of phraseology that's thrown out there by both sides of the table, by many different officer, offices and, mm -hmm. and places about, you know, being true to yourself and being empowered and, mm -hmm. you know, words are great, but they can be interpreted different ways by different people. And I think sometimes performers think empowering themselves is, is forcing themselves on you. Mm -hmm. um, walking right. in and saying that I'm going to introduce myself to each person behind the table because that's why I, they're there and that's why I'm here. And you know, I'm like, I get that. However, I've allotted you a certain amount of time. And if you want to spend four of those five minutes that you're allotted <laughs> saying hello Shaking to a bunch hands. of people, yeah. go for it. But I'm going to cut you off when the five minute marks because I'm not going to let my schedule fall behind because you're trying to empower yourself by bullying yourself in front of mm. a bunch of, of people that way. There's a table between us for a reason, right? Yeah. And, and, and when it's time to become more communicative, the team will let you know as the host of the room, us as the host of the room, we will let you know when it's time to start chatting and, mm. and being a little bit more human and having a little bit more fun with the time. But until then, like, stay on task. You know, yeah. show up when you're supposed to, come in the room, get your job done, and walk out unless you're asked to stay. Um, and I think that would be a good thing for some of the kids coming in from schools to learn, for sure. And I think there's a lot of basic things that seem like they're being missed, like, in terms of how many times will someone will tell us that the, the they're looking for an agent or hey um do you represent i'm like we don't represent anyone yeah you know like they don't even know the basic difference between a casting director and an agent or mm. resumes that we get that has have absolutely no contact information on it whatsoever yeah <laughs> you know? it's just a list of shows and their yeah. name and, their name. and, and yeah. i'm like are we supposed to look you up and this poor person waiting by their phone you know yeah. <laughs> it's like why yeah. is not me holy don't call me i know they'll call me and you know i kids who get here and don't know what to do like 
job, like you have how to a live. survival job, yeah. like just basic living yeah. things. What the how the subway system works? Like <laughs> learn how to cook a chicken. Yeah, to, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> New York City is its own yeah. something you have to learn. As, as opposed to and 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 that kind of gets me into auditioning versus performing it took me a while but it's something that I've learned are completely different art forms in a way Absolutely. because what you do in an audition room yes it's a performance but it's a more business oriented interview performance and then there's more artistic creativity that can come into the stage performance sure. do you find that people maybe don't know that difference or well, we don't see the performance part too much because like we you know we're fortunate to get to go and see performance but we never see the rehearsal processes right mm -hmm. so uh, but but I agree I agree with that for sure um, and I think you have to learn how to audition um, you have to learn how to live here and until you've got those skills down someone's gonna come in and just be better at it because they've been doing it longer mm -hmm. so you know I like to tell people like take six months to figure out the city like I was saying like learn how the subways work so that you're not frantic right trying to get there and you know, when we need you there, you can't be like, I've only been here for a couple of months and I, and I got lost. That that doesn't help. Like, that that's the wrong place to be then. Um, you know, take care of one need, and then once you're set, then move on to the other stuff. Like, taking work, like a lot of kids will poo-poo jobs like that are cruise ships or something, but you can save so much money so that when you come back here, you can actually... Be an actor, mm -hmm. not be a waiter. Yeah, <laughs> you know? which yeah. there's nothing wrong with waiting tables, Mike. Right, 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 but but that's the balance in so. having a survival job that doesn't take away from the auditioning, but yet you have to survive, so yeah. you can audition more. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. Balance. And again, things change, and and how communication happens changes. But you know, back when I was performing, if an audition came through, you yeah. you changed your life to suit right. that opportunity. Yeah, and more and more and more whether it's agents working on behalf of their clients or actors that we're contacting directly, we'll send them an appointment and they'll be like, yeah, that time doesn't work. Can it be 20 minutes later? And I'm like, 20, what, 20 minutes, what, yeah. what, what can possibly be going on in your life that you need to move something by 20 minutes? Or just thinking that we're going to move our entire schedule or team's availability to suit when you want to be, not when you can be, when you would prefer to be. Now, I will admit I have done that with casting directors because <gasps> I'm, I'm trying to schedule things in the day or, sure. or this or that. Um, so would you say that that's a no-no or it's just like don't do it a lot or I, mean, I think there's a difference between like I have another audition I'd love to fit them both in in one day mm -hmm. and like I live in Washington Heights and I don't want to go downtown till afternoon or you I know, have a like, lunch date and I don't I'm not available till after we'll cancel the lunch date yeah. I mean like right. this is not a made-up circumstance like we've yeah. been contacting me like I have a lunch date planned can I come in later and you know when we can accommodate that of course we're happy to but there comes a point where it's like if you'd like to be available for this job then we would really like you to show up when yeah. it suits our schedule and our team and it's not yours you know auditions happen and somebody be like i've got to go downstairs i'm in another call and i'm singing can we come back up and if we can make it work great but there's also a point where it's like you have to pick which room you're going to be in right yeah. And, yeah. And, and that's and, fine and that's fine yeah. like and we're really okay with that here's your picture back we'll see you at another call but you can't play in this room today because we need you now yeah this is it and yeah. and that's fine make your choice but we can't the world is not built to suit every single person's yeah. schedule and preferences and it yeah. just does feel a little bit more like that hmm. these days and, Understood. A, and then a surprising amount of people don't confirm appointments like we have to chase somebody two, three, four times to find oh. out if they're coming or not, oh, and that's yeah. frustrating because we're now also that like, I do, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> we also have you know, a yeah. list of actors who would be happy to take the mm -hmm. audition spot that we gave to you. So can you just let us know if you're coming? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I couldn't imagine like getting an audition appointment by email or phone or anything and not immediately being like, I'll be there. Yeah. Or can I change anything? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's. It's kind of shocking. So obviously appointments are one way that people get in, but EPAs, course calls, are another. And I, I spoke to some friends of mine who are just kind of getting to the city, and I because they're, they're going to have a different perspective from me, so I, I wanted to kind of get a sense of things that they were wondering about. And that, that this was one of the things that they wondered. With regards to EPAs and ECCs, how much do you take from those and actually cast, and how much is it really based upon the appointments? Like what's the ratio of that? You know, it changes show to show by the ratio, but our office always has people in the actual yeah. team process based off of open calls, ECCs, and EPAs. If you're right for the job, you're right for the job. Mm -hmm. Like, it, that's all that matters to us. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't yeah. matter where you come from, <laughs> you know. And, and we both stood in enough lines to know mm -hmm. that, that that time needs to be honored. 
um, and and we need to pay attention. And you know, I think as soon as we think we know who everybody is, I think that's the beginning of when I would feel like a failure as a casting person. Right, because there's um, always new people always coming in new people every month. And, and <laughs> always, you know, yeah. there's a bus that just let off at you know Port Authority <laughs> right now with a bunch of new people. Yeah. Um, so we were just in an ECC and two people from that now have principal appointments for the next project that we're casting at one of our regional theaters. See, I wonder if that happens yeah. with the ECCs that then it bumps up to oh, principal. Yeah. 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 yeah, if you're right, you're right. Like, who, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. It, it would be it would be foolish of us not to, I think. <laughs> you know? well, well, yeah, if a good person comes along, <laughs> yeah. then a good casting director is going to notice that. Yeah. And, 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 and bring them along. And it's also exciting because you see people get, there's a little bit more of an excitement response when I think there's a, an attitude where people don't think anything active happens in those calls that they're just required and they're mm -hmm. kind of lip service and it's just yeah. happening because it has to. Well, that's not true. Like, yeah, and and when you see the recognition on their faces of like, oh my gosh, I went to an ECC and I, I, I'm getting to go into a callback or I'm getting yeah. to come in for yeah. the team. So like, yeah, it works. Like the system works, you know, and I think everybody is so quick to try to circumvent it or, or uh, bypass certain parts of it um, because either they think they're they're in a position to based on their career to do that or they just think they know somebody and they can get around it it's way better to just kind of go with the current mm -hmm. let it do what it's supposed trust to do process. and trust the process <laughs> and, and and one of those things that have been added to the process over the years has been the one-on-ones people going to actor connection or or, or different places that do one-on-ones with casting directors music director whoever is in the room how often do you guys do those and how helpful do you see them as someone coming to the city? I mean, I think they're all educational experiences, no matter how you slice it. Like, you go and you talk to people and they kind of learn exactly like what we're talking about now, because yeah. we get to actually teach them things and adjust them and help them see it the way we see it. And they learn more about, I think specifically, at least when I do them, I don't know, we're never together, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of, you know, it, this is how the process actually it's a lot of what we're talking about this is how the process is yes go to auditions yes do that a lot of q a kind of stuff i mean i think they're helpful i mean some more those and other more so than others I, you know and i think actors need to know why they're going to the different places yeah. i think you go to some of those environments and specific people in those environments to be taught how to be a better artist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then sometimes you go in because you're looking for the networking connection because you have as an actor hopes of getting into that person's room right. so what better way to learn the taste of an individual than to spend a few minutes whether it's on your own for seven minutes or in a group environment of 20 with a Q&A you get mm -hmm. to meet us as people a little bit more it's a little less with a table between us yeah so maybe it also takes a little bit of the the fight or flight the pressure. off of yeah. it because at least we've been human with each other for a few minutes so it relaxes you guys a little bit more and us too mm -hmm. you know and 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 because uh, we're talking about earlier about personalities and how you know you are sort of casting a person to to know that they're going to be right. a good human and what they're like in a room and how they take adjustments are they willing to play with you or are you going to tell them to do something and they're going to like you know cock their head at you and be like what that's yeah, not what the character that would do yeah. you know and see how they communicate and see how game they are to play yeah. yeah, like sometimes that's it's learning for everybody. So it's taking those kind of one on ones as more of like a, a workshop, a get to know you on, on both sides of the table yeah. uh, rather than an audition or yeah. something uh, uh, to prove yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of a business rationale on it. And I think mm -hmm. the actor as the consumer in the market, you know, as a group, you guys are in charge because you're the mass. You're, you're where everything stems from. Every headshot photographer, every workshop in class, every audition room that's rented, yeah. all is because you guys have that need. We're facilitating that need. So, you know, come and meet us in these environments and be smart about why you're doing it. Right. You know, I just think it's really important. Like, be a smart consumer. Do your research. Um, know what to expect. Have an expectation when you walk into those places. And a little bit at the end of the day, kind of going back to like, we don't get to pick who gets a job, so it can't really be an audition. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. because we don't get to pick. So, yeah. you know, we we say we have all the responsibility and none of the power. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so, like, yeah, yeah I, th so I think, think that's something to think they're auditioning. That's not a smart thing to do because we don't yeah. choose. I, th I think that's an important distinction to realize that you're you're a way to get in front of the people making decisions. So obviously, getting to know you is good and 
having a good impression but but at the end of the day you're just the funnel yeah. bringing it to the to the yeah. people who make the decisions and I know we both have had people ha that have sought us out in those educational environments and after two or three times I know I've said to them I'm like me too. stop stop paying to meet me like I got it yeah we're good we know you yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like when you're right promise you'll come in and go meet somebody else like go get somebody else's point of view on your material so that you have a wider perspective on how your material is mm -hmm. being received yeah. you know because I think that's a great takeaway from those environments mm -hmm. if you go and do yeah. the same kind of work um, in front of multiple offices then you get a wider response on how you're being received and what the industry's response to you is because mm -hmm. you know I like to say like the industry does have a voice and if you Absolutely. guys listen you'll hear what we all think and they're, you, it's usually pretty consistent and this actually brings up a, another question. This is something I've discovered on social media, which is, of course, becoming a, a lot of our lives. And yeah. <laughs> and one of the hashtags that began was yes or no. And this is basically actors wanting a yes or no from you guys as far as was I cast or was I not, rather than just if, if you're not cast, you don't normally hear anything. And if you are cast, then, of course, then they contact you. And it's actors wanting that yes or no either way what are your thoughts on such a, a of a need for <laughs> actors so to, to need like, <laughs> really honestly I, I, for me some of it's time like yeah. we just don't have the time to contact yeah. 2,000 people that came in and tell them they didn't get a job which also would kill my soul mm -hmm. um, we actually do on our website on our audition info page we write like offers out casting complete like we try to so if people go on there they can see that at least what we're working on. We try to update it. Again, yeah. it's all about time. If we don't have time, it doesn't get updated. But we try yeah. as hard as we can to keep it consistent. And at least someone and can go I'll look. be a little snarky and be like, you know, uh, assume the answer is no unless you hear yes. How about that? <laughs> that that's sick. Like you know what I mean? That's... Like, I mean, I think that, that kind of just, that's too easy to feed into a quote unquote millennial point of view. That's too, that's just too easy to feed into an entitlement point of view. And I don't really support that. But like the process is set up as it's set up. If you if you move forward, you'll be contacted. If you're not contacted, then you didn't move forward. So there's your answer. Yeah. I will laugh yeah. when someone will say, you know, oh, is so-and-so in the running for this job? And we'll be like, call back to last week and you knew that. So no. Yeah. So no, no. <laughs> or before the day's over, when somebody's yeah. calling us and be like, did they get the job? I'm like, we're still in the we're still session. Here. Yeah. Like, they just walked out. <laughs> you know, like, could we finish? That's so funny. Yeah. But everybody wants it when they want it because that's what they feel they deserve yeah, at that a, moment yeah. in time. A, a mutual friend of ours, Michael Kostroff, who's been on the show before, yeah, one of his things is like, I always assume I'm not going to get the job. Yeah. And, and to me, <laughs> yeah. like, like when I, I took his class about that, and it was such an, I, it's like most of this job of performing and auditioning is about no. no. It's about rejection. Yeah. And so I have to realize that. <laughs> and then sometimes I get cast. <laughs> yeah. That's the exciting part. Which makes it really awesome when it happens. Exactly. Because, yeah. yeah. you know, I think we, uh, there's nothing better than giving somebody a job. There's mm -hmm. nothing That's better true. than saying to somebody, you it's got you. picked. That's amazing. Like, the, the acknowledgement of, of their work and all their blood, sweat, and tears that got them to that mm -hmm. moment, like you just see the glow and nothing beats that. Nothing ever beats that. Yeah. And, then, and that actually gets me back to my, my last question. And that is, what do you love most about casting and where do you see yourselves, but also the casting company going in the next few years? Mm. Mm. Well, you know, the selfish part of me really does love exactly that like being able to tell someone they get a job and you know when we go to see the shows I think I have bawled my eyes out at every single thing we've ever cast because I get so proud of people and just what everybody accomplishes I mean theater is the ultimate team sport and like watching everyone really win it's mm -hmm. so exciting and and so fulfilling and it's like they all kind of become your children. Yeah, <laughs> so you're like yeah there, is a, there is a pride. Yeah. There is a per, <laughs> per, parental kind of pride to it. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, I, uh, I, I agree 100%. Seeing the work, one, one of the greatest things that our office gets to do is most of our theaters are able to bring us out to see a show or two. Yeah. So um, cool. And we, a lot of times you don't get to see that if you work regionally. You know, yeah. um, we, we've cast in New York as well and that's always great, but the majority of our work is either on the road or at these regional houses. So to watch the work happen um, and just see actors flourishing in the environment where they're born to be, yeah. is there's nothing like that. Because you saw them for five minutes yeah. with the script in yeah. hand yeah. and now or they've taken on the characters. just who were terrified when they walked in the room the first time. Yeah. And then like we get them in a room together and we work with them and we work with them and then we put them in front of a team and then watching them grow in, from, in front of a team and then 
I'm thinking of somebody specific who's yeah. like now the lead on the show and I'm gonna cry because like <laughs> she's so beautiful and so good and she was such a star and she just didn't mm. know it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? that's so wonderful so that, that but we did from the yeah, moment we met her the second we saw her like it was yeah and, so like you that know, kind of stuff so like you know, totally and, nice. and, and to <laughs> that you know I think that's also part of like trust the process mm -hmm. there's a reason why it takes four or five auditions to get yeah. in front of the creative team yeah. because you, we have to build up your confidence and make it normal for you to be in that room with that material so that when you're in the third time and suddenly there are producers around the, right. the stakes go up and we're yeah. back to fight or flight and then people start short circuiting yeah. so and then there's cameras there because somebody from the team is in, in this country <laughs> right, so yeah. they need to see it there so they're Skyping. And suddenly you yeah, get in and yeah. you see cameras and a team and you're like oh and it throws you off your game you know like, yeah so yeah because because most epas are maybe one or two people behind it and yeah. yep, maybe they're a casting assistant maybe yeah. it's one of you guys whoever but it's just like a very intimate, small. But I've I've been to an EPA where this is EPA, mind you, like first audition EPA. Susan Stroman was in the room. Yeah. Tara Rubin was in the room. Yeah. Two producers were in there. It was like, did I get the call back? Yeah, like, <laughs> these were like, like, great. These were seven people. Like they were all like big wigs behind yeah. the table. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, Sometimes well, Sometimes you never know. No, <laughs> you no. Know, I was so surprised. It's, it's it, it, it has. There's so many rewards to doing this. Um, uh, you know. It's great that we're able to afford an office and we've got a great staff that yeah. we've built, um, which is allowing us to do more projects. Yeah, um, so there's awesome. that side of it, which is a benefit. But ultimately, I think we both love theater and we both love watching people perform. And whether it's in television or on a print ad, um, there's a lot of pride in just saying, we did that. Like, yeah. we helped make that happen. And everybody watches it. That's mm -hmm. cool. You know, yeah. like that's. I don't know where we're going, but... Yeah. We're going to have fun getting there. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. More. <laughs> Doing more of that. More. More would be good. We're ready for more. Uh, yeah. And right. just remember, you're just Kobe Beef on a buffet of talent, right? Exactly. Oh, my God. I like that. I like that. I'll bring the wine. You've been listening to Scott Wojcik and Gail C., casting directors with Wojcik and C. Casting. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver-Jones, and if you got as much out of this episode as I certainly did, please share it with those who you know would get a lot out of it. Next time, join me for a talk with Chris Coyne, Emmy-nominated sound editor and a great friend of mine. Until then, keep making it and have a great day. <laughs>